introduce our superintendent, our superintendent chat tonight. And I want to um, recognize or bring to your attention some outstanding achievements on behalf of Dr. Beasley. Uh, Dr. Beasley has over 20 years of dedicated service and more instructional practices and has held numerous leadership positions throughout the country. And Dr. Beasley has an impeccable ability to improve student academic achievement, strengthen community engagement, and also develop sustainable strategies for community engagement. Dr. Beasley received his Bachelor of Science degree in mathematics from the University of Matalpa, Matavala, uh, a master's degree in mathematics education from Stanford University, and an educational specialist and a doctorate degree and education with an emphasis on educational leadership from Stanford University as well. Again, it's my pleasure to recognize and welcome Dr. Beach and all of our guests into Forest Park High School for this particular superintendent's chat. Without any further ado, Dr. Beach. Let's give our principal a great round of applause. We always love coaches to come to Forest Park High School. Mr. Manning said his students are doing well this year. I said every time I come over here, they seem to be doing well. So thank you, Mr. Manning. Well, welcome, everyone. Let's see who we have here. Parents, raise your hand. Very good, very good. Staff members, raise your hand. Very good. Students, raise your hand. They're all out on the field. They're all out on the field. They're practicing. Well, it's good to have you here today, and really this is our opportunity to engage our community, give you a chance to, to hear the, the areas of focus, give us a chance to hear from you as we take in the information and we inform the work that we're going to do that we are doing on behalf of our children. Again, thank you for being here on today, and we just want this to be a productive conversation, and so I don't want you to feel like you have to... Um, be careful about what you say. I just want you to share um, when we get to that point in the, uh, on the agenda for you to share. The first thing I'd like to do is to just talk about the areas of focus. So uh, we have a brochure here. If you've not received one, please take a brochure. And Jada's just going to uh, basically help us through the PowerPoint. I won't read things word for word. You'll see that the PowerPoint is really just an outline. But I just wanted to share the five areas of focus with you on today. Over the years of uh, the time that we've been here in Clayton, I started out as the Chief School Improvement Officer in July of last year, and we've had a, a, a great opportunity to work with our principals and teachers and other staff, central office staff, even some parent groups to really make sure that we identify areas of focus that would fundamentally improve our district. It is so important that our students our students are provided those opportunities that will give them what they need to meet college and career standards. And so you'll see the areas of focus are founded on ensuring that our students improve, achieve higher levels of performance, etc. The first area is providing academically challenging and safe environments. And what does that mean? Basically what that means is in every classroom, the students should have access to the curriculum through rigorous instruction, engaging strategies that will allow them to achieve content mastery. Students should be able to master the grade level content that they are taught, period. Goal two acknowledges the fact that sometimes in order for that to happen, you have to provide additional support to students because sometimes it just doesn't click the first time. Sometimes a student may have prior grade level skills that are absent or deficits, if you will. And so goal two acknowledges that every school should build some support opportunities for into the school day, outside of the school day, beyond the school day for students to get the additional support that they need. And so we talk about academic and wraparound support. The wraparound support would mean the, the services and, and support that students will need sometimes because of things that happen outside of the classroom. 
that directly impacts how they perform in the classroom. Schools, through counselors, social workers, etc., and other opportunities that may exist within the school, within the community, are positioned, uniquely positioned, to provide wraparound support. The third area of focus would be professional development. We acknowledge that our students will only grow to the level that we grow. Therefore, as teachers, as employees, as leaders, we've got to grow. We've got to grow in our content knowledge. We've got to go deeper. We've got to make sure we understand what we're teaching so we can teach it very well. We've got to grow in our pedagogy. We've got to know how to engage students in various strategies and even question students so they can have every opportunity to think critically. And then, of course, we've got to grow in our leadership. All of our principals are here, and we converse on a consistent basis that the school will go no higher than the leader, period. The research is very clear in education that schools that improve have principals that lead improvement. Therefore, we have as a part of our professional development plan, leadership development, building the capacity of leaders, building the capacity of teachers to serve as teacher leaders, principals working with teachers to identify what the problems are, to plan collaboratively, and to ensure that that instructional experience in the classroom is one that is advantageous for our students. The fourth area of focus, of course, is what you see here tonight, family and community engagement. This school, this school system only exists because of the families in this community. Absent the families in this community, there is no reason for the school system to exist. There's no reason for the school to be here. Therefore, it is incumbent upon us to ensure at the school level, at the district level, that we engage our families in this work. We got to ensure that teachers and parents are working together, principals and parents and students are working together, that there are opportunities for our parents to be involved because these are their schools. This is their school. We are employees of this school system. This school system is funded by this community. Therefore, it just makes sense to us in this room who are on this team that families in this community should be engaged. And lastly, communication. Ensuring that we're transparent that we're communicating information in a timely manner, that we're creating a, a, a good image, if you will, for our school district, that we're sharing the good things about our school. Why is that important? Who wants to come to your school and your school system if all they hear is negative stuff? Who wants to come? Who wants to stay? If you're not careful, the only ones that will stay are those who can't find a way out. And therefore, it's important that we communicate the good, that we communicate when we have challenges and how we're working on those challenges, that we communicate so that others will see that our students are good students. I often say, if you don't speak well of your students and if you don't lift up your students, please tell me, Who's coming to your community to do so? I don't know of any organization out there, any group, that will come to your community to lift up your students more than you will. And so these areas of focus are critical to us creating a high-performing culture in our school district. And I use the word culture very strategically because it's in a culture of high performance that high-performing students are actually produced, and they're sustained, and they continue to improve. And so these are our five areas of focus. You will see, and uh, Jada will post this PowerPoint if it's not already posted, but you'll see that there are actions, critical actions that will be occurring in all of the areas, curriculum and instruction, human resources, school leadership and improvement, in our business services department, in safety and security, you'll see very critical action that will be occurring over the next several years 
that will support creating a culture of high performance. We've got to be more efficient. We've got to be more effective. This community deserves that. This community should see that in our practices. Every day, every day, this community should see that. Data showing you here just one graph that we use with our principles because we know that the research is clear. There are nine characteristics of high performing school districts, schools and school districts. Our framework, our work is to ensure that those characteristics are deeply embedded in our practices here in Clayton County Public Schools. Will it happen overnight? It will not happen overnight. Will it require a lot of hard work? Of course it will. Anything worth having is worth working for. And so you'll see that our actions over time will support the deepening of those goals, the processes and supports, those nine characteristics. And notice number three, effective leadership. That includes the superintendent. That includes the cabinet. That includes the central office. That includes the principals. That includes classroom teachers as well. <laughs> effective leadership is very important to ensuring that those nine characteristics to some degree and in some, in some combination are evident in our school system. It's important that we understand what we're working to do. Jada, if you will allow your staff to just share the, the data here. And I want all of you, well, I may have one here. I want all of you to see why this, this is important for us to, this work is important. These areas of focus are critical to what we've got to do in our district. And one thing you'll see, you'll learn this. I don't mind sharing with people the data. I don't have anything to hide because the data is not just a reflection of me, it's a reflection of who? Us. It's a reflection of us. Now my role as a superintendent is to work with all the employees and parents and all in the room to assure that we, we improve this data, that this data goes in the positive direction. But I want you to see, and I've only given you portions of the data, but it allows you to see what our challenges are. And so on the first page, page one of six, you have grades three through eight data relative to ELA and mathematics. Now, just in case you didn't know, we take Georgia milestones in the spring of every year. There are four performance levels, the beginning level and the developing level. Those are the two lowest levels. And then, of course, if a student is performing on grade level, you have the proficient and the distinguished level. So DL is the beginning level, DL is the developing level, PL is the proficient level, and DS is, would be the distinguished level. I want you to see in the green and yellow columns the percent of our students in our district. So I have the district, the MRESA, which would be the Metropolitan School District, and the state of Georgia. I want you to see for each grade level the percent of our students who are proficient or higher. So look at the green column. So what percent in third grade are proficient or higher in reading based on our spring GMAS data? What percent do you see there? Everyone sees 21 percent. So that means basically 80 percent are not proficient or high. We've got to flip that data. Everybody say flip the data. That means we need 80 percent proficient or higher, not 21 percent. So I want you to just take a look. What's the percent in fourth grade for reading? Say it loud, everyone. 27 percent. Proficient or higher. What about fifth grade? Twenty-three percent. Sixth grade. Twenty-seven percent. Seventh grade. Twenty-five percent. And what about eighth grade? Twenty-eight percent. That's in reading ELA. Now let's go to mathematics. Go to the same green column. What percent are proficient? What percent is proficient, I should say being grammatically correct, 29%. What about fourth grade? 29%. What about fifth grade? You see that? And then seventh grade, sixth and seventh grade are also 21%. And eighth grade, it dips to what? 
So we've got on average about 80% of our kids in grades three through eight right here that are not proficient or higher. Is that acceptable? It should not be, should never be. So we've got work to do. And that's the conversation we have with our principals and they're having with their teachers to ensure that we flip this data. Now, I can assure you that that won't happen without the help of parents. That won't happen with principals and teachers not working together. It's very important that we all work together. It's very important when I come into the school during the school day, during instructional time, that these halls are clear and students aware in classes. And principals know that there's nothing going on during instructional time in the hallway. Everybody ought to be in class. And when we walk into a classroom, what should we see? We should see high levels of instruction. Teachers and students working on the grade level content. Engagement. That's the only way you change the data outcome. Clearly, we're improving. If you look at the arrows, go all the way over to the right side of the page. You can see our change from 16, from year 16 to 17, 2016 to 2017. You can see in reading ELA how we improved for the district. Notice the district column. We went up 1% in grade three. In grade four, we went up what? 6%. We took a dip in grade five, we increased in grade six, we dipped in grade seven and eight. For mathematics, you can see in grade three and four, we increased. No change for grade five, we increased in grade six, no change in grade seven, and we increased in grade eight. Do you all see that? So it's good. Now, notice that some of our increases are larger than the state in the MRESA. That is a positive indicator that we are doing something right. Because as long as our increases are larger than the state in the MRESA, then eventually we will close the gap between our system and the, the average of the MRESA and the average in the state, which is good. So we acknowledge that we are making improvements. But it's so important, so important that as a district, as a district, we understand what our challenge is, and that's why we gotta get all, all get on the same page. If we want our students to perform at higher levels, and they will, and they can, then we have to all ensure that we're working collaboratively to that end. If you will, flip the, flip the page. Look at page two of six. You see page two of six? The page numbers are all, around, all the way at the bottom. I want you on page two of six, this is third grade on page two. Locate Clayton County. Do you see Clayton County? Locate the percent that was proficient or higher. For 2015, 2016, for Clayton County for language arts. What percent do you see? 20.1, right? What was that percent for mathematics? 23.1. That was for 2015-16. Now go over to 2016-2017. For Clayton County, what's the percent for language arts? 21.3%. And what's the percent for mathematics? 28.9. Look at the change. The change in find the percent PL. We saw an increase there. 1.2 for language arts and a percent PL for math, 5.8. We improved. But I want you to look at the data for Clayton County and compare it to the data for the other districts in the metro area. For 2016, 2017, let's just look at that year. For language arts, look at our percent, 21.3, you see that? Now go down that entire column. Is anyone lower than ours? So what does that mean? Well, we got work to do. I'm gonna just tell you, we at the bottom. And I'm sorry, but I have a problem 
not necessarily with starting at the bottom, but I have a big problem with staying at the bottom. Y'all hear me? Because our children deserve better than that, don't they? Oh, yes, they do. And so this just shows you, this is third grade. Let's flip over to page three of six. You can see the data for eighth grade. And I won't go through it. You can see it. You know, you can see what it, what it says there. But I want you to see again, are we, where are we? At the bottom, aren't we? I want you to see that's our reality. And that's why we've got to establish and, and we do have a sense of urgency about this. If you will, turn to page four of six. We were discussing, we were just discussing grades three through eight, but I want you to see how our high school students did in the spring of this year. If you will, locate ninth grade literature. That's the first end of course test that you see there. What, what percent does it say in the green column was proficient? 34%. American literature, what percent? 29. Algebra one, what percent? Now I want you to take a second to compare our percent to the average for the MRESA in the green column in the middle portion of the chart, of the table, and then the average for Georgia. For ninth grade literature, our average for uh, proficient is 34. The MRESA is what? And Georgia is what? 53. And you can go down each of the, uh, the rows and look at the difference between how we're performing and how the average for the MRESA is performing in the state of Georgia. Why do I share this information? Because parents, we need our kids in school. It is so important. That's why those areas of focus are as they are. Because it is time to change these outcomes. Would you agree with that, everybody? Oh, yes. Let me tell you why we've got to change it. Because the life of this county and this community depends on these outcomes. Businesses look at our data and they make a decision to locate to this county. People make a decision to buy or not buy your house based upon this data. Some people don't think it matters, but it really does matter. It really does matter. So, I want you to see on page five and six, turn to page five and six. I want you to see, based on our GMAS data, we're able to calculate the percent of students who are reading on or above grade level. And so you'll see, for grade three, what percent of students in our district are reading on or above grade level? 58%, you all see that? So that means you got about 42% of our students who are not reading on or above grade level. That was third grade. Those kids are in what grade now for the most part? Fourth grade. And you can see the same percent. But notice from third grade, the change from third grade to eighth grade. We go from 58 to 69%. So we're improving over time. But just imagine if we can get kids in third grade reading on grade level by the time they take that first third grade reading test. You're talking about a high performing community. We'll be the talk of the state, wouldn't we? If they have mercy. <laughs> and guess what? You all, we can do it. Because we know who these kids are. We've got to provide them the instruction that they need and the interventions that they need in order to move them to a higher level of performance. And the last page, if you will, on the back, page six of six, I want you to see our grad rates. This was the grad rate for 2016. You can see from 2011 to 2016, locates all CCPS high schools. You'll see we've improved from 51.5% in 2011 to 2016, 69.1%. You all see that? 
10%. You can see the grad rate for all of the high school. We're about 10 points behind the state. We anticipate this year that we will see an increase in our grad rate. So all the data has been submitted to the Department of Ed, and so we're ready to, uh, waiting, awaiting the official release of the 2017 four-year cohort grad rate. So that's our data that we're dealing with. That's the areas of focus as we discuss. What are our opportunities? We've got to work together, first of all, to make sure that our kids are in school and that they're in class and support our teachers while they're teaching our students. Why is that important? Because I can tell you this, and you all know this probably better than I do. It's a very competitive world. And our kids are competing against the world for jobs and resources which means that they've got to be prepared. They've got to be prepared. And so we have conversations like this so we can make sure we're all on the same page. So what are the opportunities? I can tell you just working with the principals, they need the support of every parent. Working with the teachers, they need the support of every parent. Opportunity. We've got to support each other and we've got to be uh, in communication with one another. Every parent should be going on infant campus checking grades. Every parent should be working with teachers responding. Holding our children accountable. Last year in our district, in our secondary school, you need to know this, roughly about 60% of our students, 60%, Six out of every 10 students had six or more absences. Now, you can talk about high performance from here to the end of the, end of the time, but if children don't come to school, it's not going to happen. So I don't know what changed from when I was in school because when I was in school, I hated to be absent. I don't know why it's so normalized for kids to be absent from school. That's one reason we strengthened the attendance protocol this year, because we're going to change that norm. Kids have got to come to school. See, it's the adults in the community that set the expectations for a community. That creates a culture for a what? A community. And a culture of high performance takes place every day. It's reflected in the decisions that we believe or the actions that we take that convey what is important and what is not important. We need our kids in school, and when they're in school, they need to behave and go to class and be engaged and participate in the instructional process. We as the adults, opportunity for us, we have to convey to them and through our expectation how important this process of education really is. See, they may not see it the way we see it, but we've got to know, we've got to have that advantage, the years of the, the age, the years of experience that we have, that we can look down the, the road years from now and see what challenges they will have if they're not prepared and have the appropriate levels of education. And then it's our responsibility to steer them around those obstacles. So there are opportunities for us to be engaged. I've shared with you our areas of focus. We've looked at the data. We're working to flip and to change these outcomes. As you visit our schools, parents, you should see students in class, teachers teaching. That shouldn't be an exception. That should be the norm. No one should be surprised that kids are in class. We ain't giving out awards for people in class. That's the way it should be because that's foundational. That's a prerequisite to changing the data. When you walk in these schools, you ought to walk into a very positive, healthy environment. Administrators and students and teachers and, and parents all working together to change those outcomes. So at this time, I am going to invite you to share, ask questions, 
we have staff members that are here, and what I'd like to do is um, I want to introduce, because these are individuals that serve this community, so I want to introduce the staff members so you'll know who the key people are that work with the superintendent. I'm going to just start over here. We have Dr. Simpson. He's a deputy superintendent for school leadership and improvement. He supervises all the assistant superintendents who supervise the principals. Okay. We've got Dr. Smith back there, our deputy superintendent, second in command of the school district. We have four assistant superintendents who report to Dr. Simpson. They supervise the principals. They support the principals. If there are issues that leave the schoolhouse, they are often the first person to deal with the issue. So I see Mr. Guiney, assistant superintendent. I thought, uh, Mr. did I see anyone else? You directly report to Mr. Guiney. Very good. Do we have any other assistants that are here? No? Okay. So, but that's important that you know who your deputy superintendent is and your assistant superintendent. I want to introduce Dr. Sandra Nunez, our Deputy Superintendent for Student Support Services and Federal Programs. That includes special education, counseling, et cetera. We have here our Chief for Safety and Security, Chief Traywick. We have one of our new members on board for a new area because it's so important. Mr. Wendell Stever, he leads our engagement governmental relations and partnerships so we can get more support in our schools. We have our communications, public relations and marketing department, Ms. Jada Dawkins. She leads that department. These are individuals we are here to serve our community. I want to introduce um, Mr. Kenneth Thompson, our chief financial officer. Very important. I see Mr. Rod Smith, our technology uh, guru or officer, if you will. I'm going to just introduce the others because this is an important area. Mr. Kenneth Thompson leads operations. A part of operations would be the transportation department, and most of you probably have a kid that gets on the bus. Y'all see that man right there? He's the one. <laughs> He's the one, Mr. Harold Walker. He's the one. And while we have others, Ms. Trina Smith works with special ed. Let's just introduce her. I see our director for HR, uh, Mr. Greg Curry, Damaris Scarrett. We've got Mr. White who works in communications. We've got Dr. Wiley who works with our school choice and fine arts programs. But we're here to serve you. We're here to serve our community. Our job is to make sure this data changes, to support, and it's clear, we're clear. There are two groups in our school district, those who teach, and those who support teachers. All of us are those who support teachers. That's what we're here to do. And we're clear on that. All of us are evaluated on results. On results. We expect to see this data, our outcome in this district, improve. And guess what, y'all? It ain't perfect. It's because our children deserve that. I hope I introduced everybody. So at this time, we'll open the floor for you to share. Jada, did we have anybody sign up? Yes, sir. So far, we have four today. The first is Hugh Bivens. Hugh Bivens. Mr. Bivens, you got a mic for Mr. Bivens? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Singleton invited me tonight, and I thought that she'd be here if we discussed this, and she wanted me to come and present my ideas. Uh, I noticed you started off talking about college and careers. Does that include technical education? That is correct, yes, okay. sir. Okay, well, when I came along, uh, if you didn't want to go to college, they put you over to the side. They didn't, they didn't you know, want to fool with you. And I noticed here lately, we we're getting want to get back to technical schools because uh, colleges are putting out kids that have high debt and can't find a job. So um, I was asking Miss Singleton. She said she worked on a a thing with the uh, fire department where some of those students could uh, 
get involved with the fire department and eventually maybe get on. And I said, well, why can't they do the same thing with uh, electricians, plumbers, and heating and air? You got those in your schools already, placement already there. So if you can mentor those some kind of way, especially the kids that don't want to go to college, that if they're out of school, maybe they found that they can't keep up with the regular studies, so they don't get enthused about coming to school. So that's well, my we appreciate suggestion. that, and just so for the benefit of all, you mentioned the fire, 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 firefighters and EMS pathways at Monday's Mill and Drew High School, new programs this year. But we are having conversations right now. We're looking at all of our career tech programs, and every high school has career tech programs. But we are looking at some possibilities relative to uh, HVAC. We're looking at um, some of these areas that even we have a need for to produce some in, uh, workers in our school system. And so we appreciate you sharing that. But I want to make sure everyone knows that every high school uh, has career pathways. We even have a, uh, at our Perry Center, we have opportunities there. We're looking long term. We're looking long term to hopefully create a career technology center because there are some programs that are very expensive to, to suit out a lab. So we're looking at creating a district-wide uh, career technology center that will also be able to support those careers that we know that clearly there's a need and we would do well to prepare our students to fill the, the needs in those areas. I mean, they're not going to make tons of money doing repair work, but if they if a starting position better than minimum wage. Yes, sir. We agree totally. Very good. Thank you. Hi. What key areas, if any, do you feel um, your local elected officials can support you in this process? Well, that's a good question. As a matter of fact, we met with them last night as we were discussing a draft of some legislative priorities. Uh, one, one area that we believe that they can support us in it would be to continue to advocate for uh, increased funding at the state level. While the state has uh, increased the education budget, we are noticing that, of course, with austerity cuts, we, they pull out so much money from our budget and we're paying more and more money for employee benefits. Right now, employee benefits comprise almost 27% of our budget and that expense is continuing to increase. Well, if the state doesn't give us some money to, to mitigate for that increase, it is unsustainable if it continues to rise. So we believe that if we could get more funding, you say, why is that important? Because if, as long as you continue to increase the benefits, then that takes away money that I need to hire teachers uh, if you're not helping me address it. So that's one area that our elected officials can help us with, and they're committed. I, we met with them again last night and they helped us, they're helping us to formulate this legislative priority or these legislative priorities. I think another area would be to ensure that our county as a whole uh, is really at the table, that when policies are made, that we're the fifth largest, you all know we're the fifth largest district in the state. There should be no decision made about education and we're not represented at the table because 54,000 students are impacted in our district. And so just representing us at the table, if you know of some legislation that will have some consequences or impact, let us know. Invite us to sit on the committee to represent. There's no reason why um, myself or my staff or other teachers in this district, principals, should not be invited to be a part of those conversations when legislation is being Consider committees are being formed to study the impact of legislation. There's no reason for our district, again, the fifth largest in the state, not to be at the table. And so we should always, always be at the table when decisions are made that will impact our district. And those are just a few things, but a, a good start. And also helping our parents to, to come out and support the endeavor. Next, Ms. Janet Matthews. Matthews. 
First of all, I want to say, yes, I'm Janet Matthews. I'm the Adolescent Health and Youth Development Coordinator for the Clayton County Board of Health, and I'm still trying to get that meeting. <laughs> Very good. So we're going to get you. Okay. Right. But I want to say, first of all, um, this is the second meeting I have attended, and I'm very, very, uh, it's really a good feeling. Uh, the plans, the strategic plan, everything that you are rolling out, I think is awesome. Um, and we have obviously a, mon a monumental task at flipping the data and everything. I think uh, one of the things that, um, that sticks out so much as a parent, a grandparent, uh, and just listening to everything and having meetings and meeting with uh, different people in the community is our parents. That is one of the, the most critical, I think, aspects. Um, two things that we can try and provide, one of the things that we want to do uh, from the Board of Health perspective is to provide risk reduction, uh, evidence-based curriculum. And that, I think, would help, especially with our adolescents, um, because that risk reduction behavior would be supported, uh, not only in classroom management, but just the adolescent behavior is in and of itself. The other thing is that we also have evidence-based parenting curriculum. So we are here to try and provide that type of support. Uh, I think it's critical, and when, again, just thinking back, all the things that parents are inundated with now, it's, 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 it's very challenging. It's extremely challenging. If we get our parents and we can provide some support to our parents, then in turn, our youth will be in school because there are so many challenges. So um, I just wanted to say that, and I look forward to meeting with you. And hopefully, uh, we, we have had a partnership. Let me just say this quickly. Uh, we've been in the schools for the last, I would say, six years. Uh, we received funding. We've been throughout a lot of schools and we've provided this evidence-based curriculum. So we want to continue that and I think uh, we're here to support you. Thank you. Thank you. And next we'll hear from Representative Valencia Stovall. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I first want to commend um, Superintendent and his staff uh, for doing an outstanding job. We, as you did say, we did have a meeting on last night uh, with the elected officials talking about uh, priorities uh, for the school system and how we could be more supportive and work collaboratively together. And I did want to say hello to Mr. Manning. Um, you are in District 74, so welcome to District 74. <laughs> um, the question I had, and, and it's coming from the, on the state level, uh, we've been really rolling out and really pushing hard for Move On, We're Ready. And uh, for those who don't know what Move On, We're Ready is, it allows our high school students starting in ninth grade to attend high school and college at the same time with no cost to the parents. And we also have another program through Move On, We're Ready, which is the Alternative Graduation Program, where if the student uh, completes at ninth to 10th grade EOCs, all eight of EOC courses, they can leave the high school and go full time to the college whether it's a four-year or a two-year technical, no charge to the parents. And um, so I've been on a, a strong mission uh, because there's no income uh, verification when it comes to that. You don't have to have a certain income to participate. But the question I have is, one of some of the things that moving forward uh, with the school system, how you all will definitely be promoting that more, because I do run into a lot of young people and parents they have no idea. They don't even know that transportation is available because we provided that in the budget uh, for the schools to apply for that particular grant for helping with transportation and even covering books and all of that. So that's a question that I have. Very good. Thank you, Representative Sobel. One thing we're doing is making sure that people understand that in the state it, it has moved away from the term move on when ready because most people don't understand what that is. And so we're using the term dual enrollment. And so we're trying to make sure people uh, people, parents, and all understand that there are dual enrollment options. Clearing up that uh, lack of uh, information. Secondly, we're working to ensure that we're expanding our partnerships. We have some schools that they're doing pretty good with uh, the dual enrollment option, but we've got some schools that clearly there's an opportunity there. And so we're working through our counseling department, our counselors, and we're working with the post-secondary uh, options that are available that students can get to in our county. Clayton State University, Atlanta Metro, Atlanta Technical. We're working with them. Uh, we've already met with uh, Atlanta Metro, so 
we're working to establish and really reignite some of our partnerships so we can do two things, get our students acclimated and, and participating in those dual enrollment options. But another challenge that we're addressing is oftentimes they can't participate in the dual enrollment options because they can't get past the placement test. And so we're working to support uh, the students so that they can make the scores that the colleges and universities need the students to make in order to participate in those dual enrollment options. And so that's part of the partnership conversation that we're having, that if we can maybe start with some of the eighth graders, ninth graders, to get them in, involved in some type of uh, ac academic support classes, math, et cetera, so that they can do well on those placement tests so they can be accepted for those dual enrollment options. That's the reality, and when you look at our data, as we discussed, you can see the relationship between the number and percent of students who are participating in dual enrollment options and oftentimes it's that placement test that's the gatekeeper. And so we've got to get our kids over that hurdle. In order to do that, we've got to provide some extra support opportunities, build their confidence, their knowledge base, content knowledge, so when they take those placement tests, they can make the scores that Clayton State, Atlanta Tech, and others need them to make in order to participate in those dual enrollment options. So we're looking at our data. Uh, as we implement some of these strategies so we can see a consistent improvement in that area. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Yes, sir. My name is Mike Dixma from Forest Park High School here. I would like um, a paradigm shift to be considered this may be a little bit unpopular. And I'm talking about lesson plans. Now, I know with all these schools that are, that are in our district, we, have, we must have some teachers who have some of the top lesson plans. The top lesson plan should not be a secret. If we identify excellent lesson plans, I think they should come from top down. Meaning, you should not have two different high schools in your same school district where one teacher is teaching, for lack of a better term, whatever, as opposed to another teacher doing, teaching the same content, maybe under three years of experience, struggling to put, proper, uh, put forward the best lesson plan that they can when we have superstars out there writing some of the best lesson plans. Very good, and I'll tell you my response to you is that type of initiative always starts at your school. You've got technology available. You've got the G Suite. So the, the first thing, I would work with our principal to ensure that you have an opportunity to share lesson plans using the technology that we have. Then your principal is directly positioned to work with other high school principals to use that tool to share lesson plans. So again, we have the technology. The question is, are we using the technology to share? And so I'm going to take that idea back as we work with our academic coordinators to see if we can create, using our technology, and it's very easy to do, uh, an opportunity for teachers to share lesson plans. If they're teaching the same courses, their lesson plans may be different, but they should be teaching the same content standards. Same content standards. And so again, we have the technology. It's just a matter of individuals sharing the ideas working with those who are in place, principals and all, to use those technologies to do exactly what you just suggested that we do. So it sounds like you're willing to come and be a part of that work. You know I'm going to do that to you. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hello, everyone. I'm Kristen Young. I'm from Forest Park High School. Hello. Um, my question has to do with your um, critical area focus. The second one, where we were talking about how um, students, some students might not get it the first time, they might need a second time, things along those lines. So they'll have to do it like before or after school. A problem that I've seen in the class is a lot of the students don't have transportation. So that's, a, you know, that's a problem. So is there any way that the county can do like, I know other counties do like a bus suite, like they 
drop all the students off the first time and then they come back around and pick these students up that are doing extracurricular activities or tutoring and things like that because I definitely think that that would help a lot of my students uh, I mean just overall I think that is something that can help us improve these scores because if they can stay after school even for 30 45 minutes as compared to oh, I got to catch the bus just leaving right at 402 otherwise I don't have any way to get home so that's a gotta, great question and I'm going to always direct you all to your principal because your principal has Title I funds. If he needs a bus to help get, transport kids after tutorials, Title I funds allows him to do that. All he has to do is identify those Title I funds to do so, work with the transportation department to get buses scheduled, and that can happen. And, and you're right, many schools do, do that. I did that when I was a principal. Many schools do that. So great idea, but notice a lot of the solutions are written where? They're right here. They're right here already in the school. Funds are available to do just that. Okay. <laughs> Sir? Kids have an opportunity to participate in extracurricular activities. Yeah. Needless to say, we know that extra help, the research proves that students that receive extra help will do better in, in classes as they you know, matriculate through high school. Okay, but oftentimes, okay, like for example, now we are in what, the fourth or fifth week? Okay, now we've missed you know, the, that period of time for those kids that are maybe falling back a little bit. And so it, by the time we get that plan in place, you know, we're playing catch up a little bit. Mm -hmm. but. I understand your point, though, but with respect to it being a school-based issue, but we're going through that process of trying to get our transportation online with that extra help and with our Title I plan. Very good. Very good. And if there's an opportunity for us to support Mr. Walker and his team, they're ready to support that. Uh, um, but I think what we have to do, and that's really the purpose of Title I funds, is it allows us to supplement what the district provides to take away those excuses so they can get the tutoring. And we don't want to hear, I don't have transportation. You don't have an excuse for that. That's what the funding is what it's for. So thank you for working with your team to address that. Any other questions? Any comments? Well, thank you all for being here on today. This has been very helpful, engaging, and we appreciate. My ask of you is, please continue to stay engaged. Continue to share ideas and work with us as we become a high-performing school district. Thank you.